Will everyone take their seats, please? We'll start the session now at 7.30. Want to start on time? Please take your seats. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me in the back, Bonnie? All right. I'm Rick Westcott. I'm from the Hartman College Toastmasters Club. And I'd like to welcome you as my fellow Toastmasters and honored guests here. This is the first time for me as a facilitator. Welcome to the two, Summer 2012 Toastmasters Leadership Institute. Mission possible to. I have to admire all of you for coming down here on such a hot day. I was walking up here with the, one of the other people and you could just feel the heat coming up the concrete. It was great getting this building and it's a great facility. All right, to make sure you're in the right place, this session is called Controlling Your Fear, Plug to Contest. Let's go over some housekeeping rules. First thing, if you've got a cell phone, please turn it to silent or on vibrate. vibrate. There are two sign-in sheets going around. Uh, there's one over there I see. Can you show me who's got the sign-in sheet now? And over here. So we got on both sides. Make sure you sign it, only sign it once. Uh, at the end of the session, I'm going to be, uh, you need to give me back your evaluation form. I'll collect them at the back door. I'll pass them out in just a moment after Charles gets started. And we appreciate your feedback from that. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Charles A. Bonilla is an advanced communicator bronze and recently achieved his advanced leadership bronze level. Charles found something he loves more than donuts, Toastmasters. Donuts, while delicious, don't offer the opportunities for one to realize one's dreams and goals. Of course, like choosing which donut one wants, one must define and declare one's dreams and goals. When he joined Toastmasters in 2010, Charles shambled along writing speeches, competing in contests, and muddling through his CL, Competent Leadership Manual. That changed when he was inspired in 2011 and at a winter uh, Toastmasters Leadership Institute. Then he declared he would earn his DTM. Since Charles has done more than he ever thought he could, including serving as Vice President of Public Relations of his home club, Unity Number 6149, and Secretary of his second club, Speaking of Leaders Number 1476353. Along the way, he was surprised to learn that he has inspired other Toastmasters to achieve. In fiscal year 2013, Toastmasters year, Charles will serve as President of Speaking Leaders and Area 66 Governor, where he hopes to continue to develop leadership skills, eat fewer donuts, <laughs> and of course, inspire other Toastmasters. Please welcome Charles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. I appreciate that. How many of you, just for a moment, just for a moment, thought that I had forgotten everything I had meant to say this evening? Okay, okay. I haven't. Just, however, the important stuff. Like, my keys, again, I think, they're hanging out of the front door. I'll just, I'll let you know. <clears throat> How many of you have competed in a club contest? Raise your hand. Great. Okay. How many of you have competed in an area contest? All right. How many of you have spoken at other clubs? Club contest, area contest, speaking at other clubs. Is there one that's more stressful than another? 
I mean, do you automatically assume that speaking in a contest is more stressful? Yes, no? No? Yes. Okay. How many of you think it's more, how many of you find it more stressful to speak at another club than competing in the contest? All right, one. Anxiety, fear, nervousness. Being nervous, even being afraid to get up in front of people is completely natural. You could say, it's like the old thing is, uh, you know, if, you're, if you totally have no fear, you must be crazy. If you totally have no fear of public speaking, maybe you are a little bit crazy. But if you are, it's completely natural. And it's, it's going to happen. You're going to get nervous. But that nervousness can actually be a good thing when you can channel it, when you can adapt it. That nervousness, that fear, can actually propel you to become more engaging, more inspiring, more humorous. But the key is to rein it in and to use it to your advantage. When you can do that, you're creating the difference. You're making the transition from an inexperienced speaker to a more experienced speaker. The first time that I competed in a club contest, I was nervous. And yet, I knew that my fellow club members were pulling for all of us who were competing. They wanted us to succeed. They wanted us to make it through without passing out or fainting. That time, I got the nod. I advanced to area. That was an entirely different experience. It was big. That first area contest that I competed in was at Lincoln Park Toastmasters. How many of you might have been there or visited that club, Lincoln Park Toastmasters? All right, their, their club, their meetings take place in an auditorium at Illinois Masonic Hospital. It's a beautiful auditorium, it's very big. It's made for professional medical type meetings. When you walk in, it's dark. The walls are heavy. You can imagine a, an auditorium filled with people in white jackets and medical people uh, standing on a stage talking all kinds of medical jargon and sharing pictures of weird diseases and stuff. <laughs> Got a visual there, right? Okay. What I will say about that room, it's a beautiful room, acoustically. You don't need a microphone. That's why those walls are heavy. They just absorb the sound and they focus it. But being in that environment, for me, it was imposing. I was intimidated. And the anxiety built. I was seeing people that I hadn't seen before, people outside of my club. There was the enormity of the event. And then there was the fact that I probably didn't rehearse as much as I should have. So for me, that first experience, I choked. I didn't even place. But that's OK. The people who did, who won first, second, and third, they earned it. They did a very good job. Was I disappointed? Sure, of course but more so in myself. But instead, whereas in the past, and how many times have we done this when you've competed in a contest or something else, maybe you didn't succeed as much as you wanted to. How many times did you go home and replay it again and again and again, if only, if only, if only? No? Am I the only one who's beat himself up after a contest? <laughs> it's not quite the way that I want to be unique. All right.
There are things I could have done. I could have checked out the place in advance. I could have rehearsed in front of a brain trust, dedicated club members who would evaluate me and direct me. That would have been positive. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. What did I do instead? I rehearsed, rehearsed in front of my cat. <laughs> totally not the thing to do. My cat is the toughest. The absolute toughest. So there I am rehearsing my speech. And she's just looking at me. <laughs> I'm not hearing any magic words. I'm not hearing tuna <laughs> or, or nice clean water. <laughs> Still talking? <laughs> I'm going to nap on the hot water pipe. <laughs> Come get me when something interesting happens. <laughs> Anything after that is a walk in the park, right? <laughs> so instead of beating myself up and rehearsing in front of my cat, I decided to do a little research and learn about anxiety. And here's what I found out. When we're anxious, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. We're anxious because we're getting into new and unknown situations, like an area contest, or a club contest, if it's your first. There's that ever-present risk of failure. Am I going to totally blow it? Am I gonna bomb? Am I gonna choke? There's also the possibility of appearing foolish, tripping over, a cord, or a tripod, <coughs> even that step like I did just before Rick began his introduction, well at least I was facing that way. Anybody see that? No, see, I shouldn't have brought, oh you saw it, okay, all right, well at least one person, I was going to say, oh, got away with it. And of course the worst thing is boring the cat. <laughs> So how do we know we're experiencing fear? Increased heart rate, Our heart's pounding, right? Maybe a little sweat. Well, wasn't that what Rodney Dangerfield was favorite, you know, famous for? <laughs> Loosening the tie, that sort of thing. Uncontrollable shaking. Lightheadedness, dizziness. Oh, hold on a second. Am I talking about giving a speech? Or am I talking about my inability to work up the nerve, you know, to ask that special someone out on a date. <laughs> Same difference, right? Uh, one of them might be. But they're very similar. So once you identify the symptoms, once you realize these things that contribute to your anxiety, you can begin to deal with them. And as you move forward in your Toastmaster's journey, you can do so in three easy steps. Not 12, not 10, but three. Three. Experience, visualization, and relaxation. Experience, visualization, and relaxation, EVR. Experience, in a way, speaks for itself. The more you do it, repetition, repeat, repeat, repeat. Make those speeches. Make those speeches in your club. Make those speeches in someone else's club, in several other clubs. Chop it around. <coughs> when you do that, you're giving yourself the benefit of speaking in different situations, different areas, different rooms. You'll learn the difference and you'll, re you'll remember them. You'll remember that and you'll recognize which rooms are better. The more you speak, the more you go around. Rooms 
have, in a way, their own personality. There are some rooms that can be welcoming. There are others that because of the lighting can just suck the energy completely out. Has anyone experienced that? Yeah, okay, great, great. Or if the room is too plain or staid, it's white and then they have the cool fluorescent lights, the ones that just shimmer with the sort of blue-white light instead of the slightly yellow light. It can be antiseptic or sterile. So that's something that you'll learn to work with to try and overcome. So learn the rooms. It's part of experience and repeat. And different audiences react in different ways. That's a tough thing sometimes. Initially, it was something that I took personally. But after a while, it's just the way it is. So repetition. Get out there. Because when club contest or when contest time comes again, you'll be ready. You'll still be nervous. There may be a little bit of those butterflies. I don't know that it will ever go away completely. But as long as you can get it to the point where it gives you that edge to propel you to be that engaging, humorous, inspiring, persuasive speaker, that's the competitive edge that you need. So there we have experience. Now visualization. How many of you use visualization when it comes to, in, as part of a process of preparing for a contest? Okay, good. All right, good. All right. I'm gonna walk you through something. I want you to work with me on this. With visual, visualization, I would like you all to close your eyes. To close your eyes. <clears throat> and I'm gonna walk you through this. You are competing in an area contest. You've advanced. Congratulations. And you know where it's going to be. I won't say where. I just want you to picture where the area contest would be. Now, picture what you're wearing. Picture what you're going to wear for the contest. Picture what the Toastmaster is wearing. Visualize yourself being introduced. How is the person introduced? Close your eyes. No peeking. How are you being introduced? If you're a gentleman and you're wearing a jacket, is your jacket buttoned? Be specific here. Your tie, is it a single or a double Windsor? I won't necessarily speak to the ladies in their outfits. It's been a while since I've worn those clothes, so I'm a little rusty there. Visualize everything, your shoes. Visualize the sound that your feet make. Is it a carpet? Is it a tiled floor? Is it clicky clacky? As a person is introducing you, is his or her voice echoing? Or is it falling flat on the floor? As you're walking up to the speaking area, visualize yourself breathing taking in that deep breath. Visualize yourself feeling confident. You're ready for this. You cannot wait to get started. You're going to do it. You're going to absolutely do it. Visualize yourself using all the tools that you have, that you've learned, in Toastmasters, your vocal variety, your inflections, your body language. How are you using your hands to accentuate a point you're trying to make? How, if you're getting to a particularly poignant part of your speech, do you 
draw back your voice so that the audience leans in to hear the next thing you're going to say. Visualize a few people in the audience coughing. Because <coughs> you know there's always, there's always somebody who does that. Visualize hearing someone unwrap one of those annoying star mints, <laughs> which of course is going to be precisely at the most poignant part of your speech. Is it a conspiracy that they make those rappers with that noise? <laughs> and finally, visualize hearing the applause. Visualize it, the pride that you feel knowing that you nailed it. No matter how the judges decide, knowing that this time this one was your personal best. All right, open your eyes. I'd like three volunteers. Just raise your hand. Three. Don't worry, it's not going to be anything embarrassing. OK. What type of room did you visualize yourself in? I visualized uh, the room where I was presenting a contest uh, in the downtown area. In the downtown area? Yeah. Was it carpeted? It was carpeted. And okay. uh, also, there was uh, lots of chairs. And uh, there was a cafeteria also available close by. So that is another was little noise coming from there. What kind of chairs? Were they creaky chairs or cushy chairs or the springy chairs that when you sit down, when you stand up, it flops back up? No, the similar chairs. Just regular chairs? Okay. All right. Let's see who else raised their hands. Anyone on this side? Nobody? Oh, all right. Okay. What were you wearing? Uh, green corduroy jacket, a green shirt, no tie. Nice. Was your collar buttoned or unbuttoned? Unbuttoned. Okay. All right. <coughs> Of all the things I described, name one thing that really, that really grabbed you, that really jumped out, that really, that you really saw anyone. Raise your hand first, that's all. What, what did you really see? Your feet clacking on the tile floor. Okay. All right. Yes? The star they <laughs> Not something I seen, something I felt. A calm. I don't know why, but a calm. Wow. Did anyone else feel a calm? I don't know what, what that means. Okay. All right. Well, good. Carry this with you. And don't wait for contest time to, to use it. If there's a particular speech that you're working on for your club, it doesn't have to be a contest time. Visualize that. When I began in Toastmasters, well, my first four or five speeches went fairly well. But I was at a different time in my life. I had plenty of time to rehearse, and I did, and it showed. Then I changed jobs, moved. My schedule was a little bit different. And I thought an odd thing began to happen. As I progressed, as I gave more speeches, I found myself becoming more nervous instead of less. And there were a few times that, in my opinion, I choked. Has anyone else experienced that? Where maybe you've gotten some speeches behind you and then you're speaking more and then you're, you're getting more nervous? OK. All right. Good. Well, not but you know what I mean. Because <laughs> that's this next part, relaxation. And we, Maybe you're a little bit relaxed now after that visualization exercise, but with relaxation, before your speech, if you're feeling particularly nervous, if you feel that you need to bring yourself down a little bit to ground yourself, try some relaxation type things. Some of these you know, I'm not gonna you know, have us all stand up and do them, but I'll demonstrate. It'll be just like I'm a 
air, uh, like a steward on the airplane, right? No. <laughs> but simple things, like if you feel tense, you know, just tense up a little bit more. You know, tense. Focus on that tension. Breathe in, and then hold it, and let it all go. Repeat that a few times. It'll help. If you're in a room like this and it's you know, carpeted, or even if it's a tile floor, but more so if you're carpeted, take off your shoes. Take off your shoes. Walk around a little bit, just in your socks. And use your, use your toes and rub, you know, rub them into the floor. That will help to ground you. If you want a little bit more, get the blood blowing, blowing. Get the blood flowing. <laughs> blood flowing. I have another exercise for that. I'm gonna tell you that. But, you know, that <laughs> the blood flowing. Do the old, you know, this thing. Do the small circles. Close your eyes. You know, do like that. You really want to do a few jumping jacks. With regard to the voice, and this is something I learned. Is that a starman? Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes, not so much that you speak too fast, but that you find that when you're speaking, your words, your words run together. And maybe they're, you're a little sloppy in the pronunciation. Or maybe, like I did just a little bit ago, get your blood blowing, blowing. Before, and this, you might feel self-conscious about it initially, but once you do it a few times, it's not going to be a big deal. It's Something that I picked up from actors in theater. Well, they, and they're completely not self-conscious about it because they do it all the time. And it's simply, just, you know, go to a corner of the room or whatever and, and then just sound out, sound out the vowels completely. You know, do the A, A, E, E, you know, stretch your, stretch your face. I, O, U, you know, and do that as several times. That's going to... It's going to stretch out your muscles. It's going to make your, your facial expressions you know, a little bit more flexible. So then you're not straining. Tell me something. How many of you felt a little self-conscious just as I described this? <laughs> yeah, right? A little bit? Oh, okay. Right? Yes, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. No, 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 no. Listen, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna open my speech. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and guests. A B I. The gentleman asked, uh, "When do you actually do this? Do you do this before your introduction or afterwards?" Definitely before. You know, arrive early, it, depending on uh, what kind of travel time you have from home to the contest. If it's not too long of a time, if it's you know, maybe a 10 to 20 minute journey or less, you know, do it before you leave. But if not, you know, do it in the car. Do it in the car. Yeah. Excellent, excellent <laughs> question. Yes, yes. To piggyback off this question, do you have any, I guess, tips or anything in while you're actually up there, so you have you know kind of the experience, the visualization, relaxation while you're up there, something in the moment that helps you either get back on track or gain your confidence. There are two suggestions that I can give you, both from experience. And this is something else. How many times you've given a speech? You're in your mind from how you visualize that you would give the speech and how you think it's actually going, you get to a certain part, there's some part in particular that you, you really wanted to nail it. For you, you missed it, you blew it, and you're thinking, oh geez, you yeah, blew it. But no one mentions it, right? Has that happened? Okay, that's great, okay. The audience isn't always going to know. Well, some of the obvious stuff, sure. But the things that are particularly resonant with you, they're not necessarily going to know. 
Two examples. I was giving a speech, I was guest speaking at a club. It was a speech about, I think of all things, it was a speech about Alzheimer's. I'd rehearsed it a few times and I wanted to you know, get some of this infor information. I wanted to get it right. It was a researcher topic, so there were different statistics about Alzheimer's and all that. And there's one point where I just got lost. I completely lost where I was. And I paused. I just paused. I just simply paused. It was a very pregnant pause, a prolonged pause. <laughs> However, it was not a deer in the headlights pause. I just stood there. Then I stood there. Instead of panicking, I could feel the panic a little. I said, well, where was I? That's where I was. And I picked up. Internally, I was dripping sweat. Well, maybe not even internally, but externally. It was a good thing I wore a jacket that night. I was just <laughs> dripping. However, what came out in the evaluation, the evaluator noted that part but in a different way, completely, than I, uh, completely different from what I had experienced. The evaluator made it a point to say that that point right there, Charles, when you paused and you just held there, that really allowed the information of what you had just said to sink in. And it really made me think. I didn't know I was going to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant, right, of course. Yeah. But, <laughs> now, the, the other example, relaxation. And this is where rehearsal comes in handy. One of the things that I've learned, I'm still in the process of employing it consistently, is rehearsal, and that's establishing zones of your speech beginning, a middle, and end. Certainly if you can do it thematically, chronologically, whatever construction you're doing for your speech, define your zones. For example, earlier on when I was talking about EVR, you know, I established you know, the E here, the V here, and the R there, and I had a bit of a transition between each. When you employ those techniques in your speech and rehearse them, and actually rehearse them. In a way, it's, it's very similar to acting. Actors have that, they combine. They combine the memorization with the flow, with the zone, with how they're reacting to the other actor in the scene. So if, if they're getting to a point where they might be losing it a little bit, that repetition, that rehearsal is going to kick in. It's, it's just like training. And that will carry you through. And even if you don't remember it exactly, you'll come up. You'll come up with what works. And you'd be amazed at, at how well you actually do that. So con consider that. Consider that. Any, anyone else? Any other questions? No? Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. His question is, how do you compensate for being in a room with poor acoustics? And before I could ask him, define or give me an example of poor acoustics, he gave me the definition that I was dreading, an echoey, an echoey room where your voice bounces off the walls. The suggestion I have there is, especially with echoeyness, speak slower. Not, not too slow, but slower to take that into account a little bit. And that's especially when you're speaking for time. One of the things that I prefer to do, I, I'm not sure why, I learned this a long time ago, but I always go for the minimum. If it's a five to seven minute speech, I'm going for five minutes because I know that when I work in my movements, my transitions, my pauses, eventually I'm going to land right, right about in the middle at six minutes, maybe a little bit more. 
But if I pack it too much, and I don't take into account those movements and those pauses, I'm going to rush at the end. And then if I'm in a room with poor acoustics, are they even going to hear what I'm saying? <coughs> Probably not. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. I just wanted to add, when she was asking about what could you do when you're yes. at the podium to kind of center yourself, you can also, you can either plant someone or look for friendly faces. So as you're giving your speech, either you can have your friends sitting in certain places, make sure they're always smiling to kind of give you that extra boost of confidence, or you find someone as you're speaking who has a friendly face. And you kind of look to that to kind of give you that little boost to keep going and to kind of center you. Absolutely, because as you do your speech, there are parts of it that are going to resonate stronger than others with, with people in the audience. So precisely that. Thank you. Yes, yes. I want to add into that. Before I start my speech in my club, I pause, look at the audience. It's like what you're saying. Yours is during the speech. But mine is before I start my speech, I look at the audience from left to right and make sure they're interested to listen and I feel relaxed. That's how I do it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so controlling your fear from club to contest. And every, every moment in between, certainly in professional environments, when you're speaking, part of your job, anything else, recognize, recognize the anxiety triggers. New situation, risk of failure, potential for appearing foolish, the possibility of boring the audience. And to avoid that, that's when we employ all the tools that Toastmasters has to offer. So recognize those cues and the symptoms. Use EVR, experience visualization and relaxation, to help you solidify not just the speech, but the presentation of it. And get out of your clubs. Visit other clubs. Guest speak. That's really going to do it. I mean, a year and a half ago, last year, if you had said that I would be in front of you here this evening giving a speech like this, ah! <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Tell me something else. I think I have a better shot at being an engineer on the space shuttle or something. Here? Please. Actually, here is a lot easier than a space shuttle because I'm not an engineer. <laughs> so rehearse, visualize. get out there and get out there. And will you ever completely control it? Probably not. But I guarantee if you consistently do these things, you, you will be able to effectively manage it. And next year, one of you will be up here giving this presentation. <laughs> Uh, right, uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Hey, I got your names. I'll check it next year. I didn't get my name, my name. <laughs> oh, has, has everyone signed? No. Sign the sheet? Where is it? Where's the sign, where are the sign in sheets right now? Who has it? Okay. Yeah, pass one up and we'll, we'll get the last few. Well, thank you very much. You've all have been great. Are there any last final questions? Any last, I can take maybe one, how many, can I take it? Are we set? Okay, yes. How do you find something good to talk about? I struggle with that more than anything, and, and then that's when I sort of start to get afraid. Did I, did I pick a good topic, and do I have enough to say? <laughs> did I pick a good topic? You know, by the time I get to that point, you know, I've already written a speech since the night before. I'm like, oh my gosh, I know I'm going to bomb, I know I'm going to bomb. Uh, uh, uh. It's too late then, you know, so I have to go with what I had. Carry a, little, carry a little notepad in your pocket. And as you see things, as you experience things, you think, oh, that'd be a great one for a speech. Or that'd be a little you know, anecdote. Keep that list with you and, and match it against the objectives in the CC manual. Oh, that would be a good speech for a body language. That would be a good speech for a researcher topic. Keep that in mind. And, and write it out a few times. And you may, you may come to some dead ends. Well, okay, that's not so good. I thought it was a good idea, but it's not. And then, and then go to the next thing. 
you're not going to know until you try, and you're not going to figure it out in your head. You have, to, you have to pursue it a little bit. Just like musicians, they try different chord progressions for songs and hit some dead ends, but then something else comes up and it takes them in a different direction. Always work at it. Always work at it. Someone else there is that. Yes, ma'am. My presentations tend to be fairly academic. Mm -hmm. And if I blunder a statistic or I misquote a resource, how would you, because that's what tends to freeze me up. And that pregnant pause you suggested was much longer and uglier in my most recent speech. What can you do if you have misquoted something that your audience may take as valid? Do you recognize it right away, or is it, okay, pause. Just simply pause. Okay. Or, or I would even say, yes. um, add, add humor. Like, oh my god, I can't believe I just told you guys that. That was wrong. You know, and you can add humor to it as well, well instead of being it. so an anxious about it. Well, certainly, right. Add humor and, and then correct it right away. Yeah. And certainly the humor, because you know what? They're all, you know, many of them are sitting out there. And they're, oh, wow. Okay, she covered herself pretty well. That's good. So you're, you're, you maintain your credibility. You acknowledge it. Wow, we're all going to make mistakes. So, but thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I think that's it. All right? Is it? Yeah, it's just the uh, sign-in sheet still going around. Thank you all very, very much. You've been, you've been wonderful. things I wanted to address. One, make sure you fill out your evaluation sheet. If I don't get back there fast enough, you leave me to the door. Put it on the table back there. There's some blank ones. And just lay it down. Two, I'd like to present to Charles a certificate in appreciation on behalf of District, District 30. Um, thank you for giving us this presentation on controlling the fear to the contest workshop and then club the contest. Let's give him a round of applause. You're not going to believe this, but there's a coupon on the back for donuts. This is my kind of certificate. The second thing, uh, the Southwest Division Toastmasters wanted us to announce that you yet have another chance to get all seven of your officers trained. They're holding a Judges and Makeup Officers training on August 2nd, and it's being held at the Wheaton Public Library. So if you do have an officer who couldn't make it to the first one, or this one, you still have an opportunity to go to this one. That's great. August 2nd, where and what are you talking about? It's at the uh, Wheaton Public Library. And you may have this one. You're welcome. Thank you, and we're done. Please leave your sheets there. I'll try to get back to the question.